Don't be the dressing room DJ. Let your pals take care of the tunes. Drive smart. It'd be so much slicker if I'd opened the door for you. <laughs> <laughs> yes! That's my friend and fellow DJ, there we go. George Bowie. Oh, How are you, man? Oh, good. Kevin and Perry for the demo. Let's do it. Let's Love do it. it. Um, right, I'm expecting the tunes to be absolutely tremendous, but I'm going to be blasting oh, like it. This is the first time I've ever driven my car without the radio on. I generally didn't know how to turn it off. And be honest, do you listen to Clyde on in the radio? Look at that. There you go. I, think, I, I feel like that's mistaken. We'll see when it's your podcast, it's Clyde one. Yeah, so what's up, man, George? <laughs> right, ready for us? Right, We're going to go, but wait. Oh, here, we. here we. Here we. Here we. Go. go. Let's do it. Let's do it, mate. Right, cool. Where are you taking us first? Right, um, I think we're going to the garage first. Yes, let's right, go to the garage. I don't mean the 24 hour garage. Right, the garage nightclub's kind of where it started for me. Because uh, my dad used to live there when he was away. Ah, you said that in the attic. attic. In the attic, like his parents owned it before him. And uh, they just decided they were going to live it. That was back in the day when clubs used to shut at 10 o'clock at night. It was all that ballroom dancing that malarkey and all that. Like, oh, don't fancy that. So was your dad into music big time? Aye, he was. My dad was like a. a Theatrical agent and all that. See the Alexander brothers, remember them? The old accordion nah, guys. He used, to, too, he used to manage them. People like that, Scottish acts and all that. Did he, right? Uh, he said he was the first guy, I don't know if this is true or not, but he said he was the first guy to take Billy Connolly to America. Wow. Back in the day. So is he still pals with Big Billy? Well, no, because he's been dead for oh, 20 sorry. years. So. <laughs> <laughs> but he was pals with him. He was pals with him, eh? Brilliant. Yeah, I'm sure if he was still alive. <laughs> I, need to, <laughs> I need to let you know, I actually do a bit of DJ myself. Right. I've kind, of uh, kind of fused flash dance with MC Hammer shit. Okay. Into that. So, party party stuff? Party party, mate. I'm all about the party, you? All about the party. I'm all I need about to the banging well. tunes. All about the banging pumping tunes. tunes. Love a banging tune. All about a banging. Um, what is this we're driving today? Right, this is, I don't know nothing about motorcycle, but this is uh, the wife's car. So, even though it's got a GBX number plate on it, she wears the trousers in this relationship. I doubt she has a cracker. Oh, well, I wouldn't say that. How'd you meet? Yeah, yeah, we that. actually met in a club. We met in the. Love that. That's what I was hoping for. I was hoping yeah. that. Did she come up to the DJ? Met in the cotton club. Um, I, I, she did actually. Well, I asked her out and she said no. And I was kind of stalking her. I knew one of her pals. I was like, right, I want to take your wee pal out. He said, like, oh, no, she's going out with some other guy. I said, well, tell her to ditch him and come with me. Who was it, Tiger Tim? It wasn't, it wasn't an RDJ. Right, it was okay. just some guy that lived near her. And uh, eventually she did. Eventually she caved. Brilliant, eh? So one of those, but th that was 30 years ago. And here what? we are. <laughs> are you still happy, huh? It was before I was on the radio and stuff. Aye. Uh -huh. Aye. What does she do? She kind of runs the whole GBX thing. Oh, does she, right? Aye, she runs the oh, whole so band and all that. Aye, we're a team. She oh, like, organises all the producers and all the remixes and stuff. And she does all the bone stuff, and All the big it? gigs and all that uh -huh. kind of stuff. And aye, it's all good. And you said you, that, that number plate's a belter, so it's G10 it's about, GBX? It's Geo GBX, aye. Wow. So How long you had that? She, well, about 10 years. She bought me from my birthday. And what see a woman. If, See if you're going to like, see if you're doing like a big event like Colours Fest or something like that, or you know, tea in the park or something. You would just drive up and you wouldn't have any hassle with the security because they would know it was you and you, straight away. And you just drive right through. It's really handy for that. Sort of and thing. also when they look through the window and they see your spray tan, they know it's you. Straight away. I will exactly. You know, did I mean, you get that done But I did because I knew I was doing you, but I didn't really do the hands very Talk well. Is it, so is it, did you get that done in the house? <laughs> no, I went to one of the hot salons in Mary Hill. Did you? Where's this guy going? And what? Did it the briefs? Um, I, I didn't the briefs. I, I had to queue. I had to queue again. It was mental. I went in, I said to the woman, I got a spray tan. She said, Oh, you'll need to wait. I said, Well, how long? Said, she said, Well, about 10 minutes. I said, That's not a problem. She said, Oh, I wish all our uh, other customers were that understanding. <laughs> it's, it's 10 minutes a big deal. <laughs> People flipping their lid because they can't get a spray tan straight away. That, that's what happens. Reese Laney gets a spray tan. Does he, eh? You should get one together. No, I don't know if I want to get a spray tan on another person, you know what I mean? That's just weird. Uh, you'd end up trying that's to get off the weird. would miss a bit. Uh -huh. How long have you had the motor for? I've had this motor, not long actually, got this motor last year. I think like November. It. Aye. I don't drive it very often. I normally drive the wee company car. We get just one of the pool cars for work. Um, but I use this for going to gigs and the missus uses it all the time because she's driving the wings about and stuff. How many you got? Let's do the score. Three. Have you right? You like Aye. them? Aye, they're all right. Aye. What are the Middle boys, girls? a bit cheeky. Um, I've got a boy who's um, 24, a girl who's 19 and a girl who's 11. Wow. And the boy's a DJ as well? boy does well. You say DJ is like heavy metal. Can you DJ heavy metal? I suppose you Have can. Have you taught him a few things? He's in it. Well, what, really. what, uh, I, got, I bought my controller. <laughs> <laughs> he DJs in the car house. So the goss? Ah, yeah, the goss. Oh, oh, yeah. He's got dreadlocks and all that. Has he? Mad. He DJs with a mask on, like Slipknot. It's mental. Oh, I love that. But I. He's an individual, isn't he? Aye, a bit different. He can't so do you, go, do you go and watch him? No, I wouldn't go to his gig. 
Why not? Because I think it'd be intimidating for me. You don't want your dad turning up at your gigs. I don't know if your dad's as cool as you. Still like football with your dad coming to watch you at the side of the face. When you're DJing, it's like, you just, no. Are you critical of him? Like? No, not at all. Uh. No, I wouldn't know what, what's good or bad in rock music, you know what I mean? Uh-huh. But he won't play bits and pieces. Like, he does, like, uh, is it Driftwood? Is that the pub? He does that on a Saturday occasionally. And then they'll come in and ask for bits and pieces. And I'm not playing that, that's my dad's tune. <laughs> I love how he, sta- he sl- stands firm on that. Uh, just not at all. Not oh, happening. Uh, as you say, Clyde One started off what work. How long have you been there now? <sighs> 32 years. Wow. It's mental. Is that mad to think, eh? How did, how did you get your break in there now? Right. What happened was, I was saying my dad was a, a, an agent and he had a comedian working for him who had done a demo tape for Radio Clyde and I had just passed my driving test. So he said, I was working in what is now the garage, it was called the Mayfair back then, uh, and he said, can you run down to Radio Clyde in the car and drop off this demo tape for one of my clients? So I went in and I said to the head of production, a guy called Johnny McCallman, he was kind of like, he used to come to the nightclub occasionally if we had live bands on, sometimes we would record them. So I knew him from coming in the club. I said, oh, I'm doing a wee bit of DJing in the pubs and clubs. And um, I said, I'd love to get on the radio. Ever any opportunities, let me know. And he said, I'm really stuck for tomorrow night for somebody to come in and uh, run some tapes. You know, just working behind the scenes, answering the phones for Super Scoreboard and then going out and wiring up a nightclub for a live broadcast and then running tapes. So it was like a 13 hour shift or something. I get about 15 quid for it. But didn't care because it got you in the door. And that was it. And I just turned up and I actually put the station off here twice, which I don't think they know about. Because it was like three in the morning. Um, the reels finished and I didn't know, it was reel to reel back then, it was old school, you know. Right. And I didn't know how to put the next one on. I had to go and find a newsreader who was half asleep to come in and show me what to do and it was like total silence. So you, the guy, a guy saved your, your career? A basically? guy saved my career and then there was another time, uh, a couple of weeks later, it was classical music they had to play between five and six in the morning because back in the day people don't remember this you guys don't know you're born <laughs> see back in the day right uh-huh. you're only allowed to play I think it was eight or nine hours of music uh, the rest had to be like non-needle time whatever that was that's like really rubbish music and uh, speech so they would do like replays of uh, looking back on it now it's ridiculous through the night they would do replays of the commentary from Super Scoreboard so like oh, if, boring that, if, if Celtic were playing Hearts that day they would repeat the commentary at like oh. three o'clock in the morning. So I would have to run that, and then I'd have to run an hour of classical music. In one week, unbeknown to me, till weeks later, I played an entire hour of classical music backwards. <laughs> and they only found out when they went to play it again and saw that the reels were round the wrong way. So did you get your ass booted for that? Um, nobody knew, because so much time had gone by, I'd kind of got my feet in under the desk by then, it right. was all good. You said you got 15 quid for your first shift. Aye. But you're getting a lot more than that. Look at the Canada Goose, young man. Well, you know, it's a present. That's a Christmas present for my mum. That doesn't count. <laughs> have you ever had, uh, Life's you, ever, good. you ever had any uh, offers to leave, Clyde? Yes. Have you, right? Yes. Why, why did you not I've take had, them? Um, well, I did once. I did. I actually did leave Clyde. I had, like, see my dad, I was talking to my dad earlier on, but see my dad, like, me and my dad were best mates. And when he died, I had a total meltdown man it was just like off it just destroyed me Mm -hmm. and I was just like all over the place and uh, Beat 106 came up and they wanted to launch it around me they said it's going to be a dance station it's going to be this it's going to be that and I thought you know what after losing my dad I just need a a change I need something I need to do something different and my head was not in a good place and it it was I was literally having a meltdown and I thought you know what I'm just going to do this I wasn't getting on with my boss at the time me and him didn't see eye to eye. I was a young guy with fresh ideas. He was an old military type that was, this is how the radio station's going to sound. And I thought, he was what, Barry Manilow? And aye, well, that kind of, uh, not as bad as that, but it was like, I it was still living in the 70s and, you know, we're going into the, the millennium, the new millennium. So I thought, oh, you know, I need a change. And I left and after a couple of days, I thought, why am I doing this? I'm, I'm really fucked up here. And uh, Paul Cooney took over. He uh, became the managing director. Me and Paul were always good pals. And he he phoned me up and he said, look, th- this is not right for you. So I'm going to buy you out your contract and bring you back. Wow. So that's exactly what they did. Million and, quid? And yeah, they, yeah. I, I was like, what more than that? <laughs> Jesus Christ, sell myself short. No, but they they paid up my contract and they bought me out and brought me back. And I'll always be grateful for that because he kind of saved me for myself. You know Paul what I mean? Cooney, what a man. Yeah, he's a good man. He's a good man. What do you prefer? Do you prefer doing like the nightclubs or do you prefer doing the, the old radio? 
Yeah. See, being a nightclub DJ, you must have seen some epic get offs there. I see some sights in the clubs, but it's nowhere near as bad now as it used to be. See, yeah. back they see the 90s, it's like, see the, the rave scene in the 90s. That was the most manic thing ever. Ever. How what sort of stuff would go on? It, well, the clubs would be on till seven in the morning and people would be out for like three or four days. It's just, <laughs> it was mental back then. It's, to, just to look back at it and to think that we're still alive. It's funny, we were in uh, Tenerife at uh, Christmas there and we're sitting at Hard Rock Hotel and I'm standing at the bar and who walks in but Gaza? Right. Right, so Gaza used to live up the road for me in Cobarkin. Right. So I'd, I'd met him a couple of times, but I don't even knew who I was. I think he just saw someone at the bar and felt obliged to talk to them. And he came over and he started talking away to me. And my wife came over and after he left, she went, who the fuck was that? And I said, do you not recognise him? She said, aye, that's one of those old ravers for the food bar. And it was, <laughs> the years have caught up them. I said, that was Gaza. She said, oh my God. She thought it was some guy that was still stuck in 1997. Hands <laughs> in the air, you know what I mean? See, when all that was going on, that rave scene, did, did you used to see, was there quite a lot of famous people that you would see in the clubs? You would see, nah, I know really. Nah. No, see the type of clubs I went to. I didn't go to the Posery Club, so I went to like the the all nighters and all that. You know what right. I mean? I was more like the Metro and the Foo Bar and Hangar Thirteen Foo Bar's and all that. Isn't it? But I, uh, I, I played there last week. I was mental. They had an old school night there last week, and uh, I was on half ten, to half eleven. I thought it was going to be dead. I turned up with twelve hundred people in the place at half ten at night. Wow, it was mental. That's the power of Bowie, thought it, it was mad. What well, uh -huh. was the power of everyone that was on? It was just people going back to their youth and it was all ages, it was mental. You ever you ever remember like DJing and think, I can't believe what I've just seen on the dance floor? Have you ever seen anything Most like? of the time I stand there and say, I can't believe I'm doing this. I can't believe I'm lucky enough to be doing this for a job. job you know uh -huh. what I mean? I've seen some sights. I remember DJ, I used to do parties. I don't do them now because I just haven't got time. I used to do like weddings or 40s or 30s and stuff. And there was a woman that had a baby and she was up on the dance floor dancing, holding the weight. <laughs> that was my old dear. I thought, this is it, man. I've seen it all now. Like, I'm talking like a six month old baby and she's holding it in her arms while dancing for about half an hour. Baby in one arm, baby was stick in the other. Aye, uh -huh. throwing some shapes. Was it always dance music that you were into? Always been into dance music. How come? It's funny. Um, just because my, I think my dad owned nightclubs. See, when I, I was about 14, my dad took me to to the club and the plan wasn't for me to be a DJ or to be on the radio or whatever. The plan was for me to take over the family business and run the club. But at 14 in a nightclub, you're kind of limited to where you can go. Yeah. So he said, you get two choices, cloakroom or the DJ box. No brainer, innit? Mm. Straight into the DJ box. Befriended the DJ and eventually asked him to show me how it all kind of worked. And eventually he thought, hang on a minute, this wee guy could start the night for me. I could go and sit, because back then the DJs used to just stand at a bar and get tanked up. And try and go Ah, exactly. Uh -huh. So he could go and stand at a bar, have a couple of beers, try and pull, and I'd do most of the shift for him. So at that's- 14? That, at 14, so I was, I would, I say most of the shift, until it got busy, he would yeah. come on about midnight. And uh, I would do maybe the first two hours, because the clubs opened at 10 back then. But I, I was a, like DJing in the town when I was 14 and then going into school on a Monday and it just, I thought, after that, I was like, I, I just want to be a DJ, I don't want to do this, you know what I mean? What an upbringing that is, yeah. It was great though, it was weird. And then I thought, I don't want to run the family business, I want to be a DJ and that's what I want to do. So did you hear like an idol growing up? Tiger Tim was a kind of idol, yeah. you know what I mean? He How was, is he? He was, he's, he's not great now, he's in a wheelchair and right. uh, he's in a bad way, it's, it's really sad to see. And he was... What was so good about him then? Just because he was like nothing else. He was so Scottish, you know what I mean? He's so Glaswegian, in yeah. fact. It was just like, it was like nothing else in the radio. And it was, he was just like one of us on the radio, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, he just come out off the street and got on and got a radio show and become this big star. And I kind of liked, he didn't think he was better than anyone. He didn't think he was a superstar. He didn't go to all the trendy bars and all that kind of stuff. He just, he was a punter that got lucky. And would he like take you under and his wing? He took me under his wing and I, I produced him for a bit and I was making up demo tapes and <laughs> this is this is a great story. I was making up demo tapes, I was working in production and in 1990, Radio Clyde used to be one radio station, it was like, now it's Clyde 1 and Clyde 2, but it used to be the same station on FM and AM and they decided in 1990 they were going to do two stations, Clyde 1 and Clyde 2. So I'd been there working in production for two years. Tiger Tim's making me up demo tapes and um, he took a demo tape into 
Doogie Donnelly. Remember Doogie Donnelly? Yeah, of course right. I do. Great, great Stilling, head of hair. T- Stilling Tilly. T- Curls t- get the girls. Doogie Donnelly. I'd kill for that hair right now. Uh, brilliant, isn't it? Lucky bastard. Would you, would you get the transplant there? Ah, I got a transplant done. Did you? I got a transplant done. You know some boys need three? Big Aye, well, I'm thinking about going back for another one. Yeah. Gary Spencer's just started at Clyde. He's had one that looks pretty good, man. Right. I want one of them. Yours is decent, though. I've done a good uh-huh. job. So, and that was 2008 I got mine, so job's a good one. But to get back right, to Dougie Donnelly and his great head of hair, he was the, the boss at the time. So Tiger Tim got me to make some demos. He said, that's good, that's bad, change that. And then he said, right, that's the one. We're going to go to Dougie and we're going to give it to him. So bear in mind, they needed to find about another 10 presenters for this new radio station. I thought, this is a given, I'm in. And he handed them a demo and he went, nah, it's everything I hate about radio. So everybody else that was working in production got a show apart from me. No way. So Clyde 1 and Clyde 2 started. I never liked Dougie Dunn. Nah, and where is he now? (laughs) (laughs) You like me now, Dougie? (laughs) How you like me now? My wife's motor. (laughs) Mr. GBX, motherfucker. (laughs) They're all weird, man. Uh, What was he going to say? So when did you get your first break to get actually a show on the radio? So what happened was uh, the bull Donnelly, he got pumped after about six months because he made an offset. (laughs) And... uh, (laughs) It could have been so wrong, Dougie, if you just gave this man a show. It would have been great. Life would have been good, do you know what I mean? And they, they brought in another guy um, called Mike Holloway, who had uh, been doing that kind of early evening show. Ian's brother. Huh? And uh, apparently he really liked me. He was he was Aberdonian, and um, he, he was a big fan of what I was doing. And he seen me doing the warm-up at the road shows, and he said, I want this guy on. And he phoned up and he said, I've listened to your demos. Tim's given me your demos. And I want you to do a show on a Sunday night through the night, just to find your way. And is that like... So, is that like when you get that phone call is that like say a footballer getting a big move is that the same yeah. sort of feeling yeah it's like you know Celtic Rangers phoning you up and saying God, your agent phone and saying right big two are interested which one do you want to go to you know what I mean so did you phone and, your dad in that so, oh absolutely and uh, well my, my mum and dad stayed up all night listening to me <laughs> mental innit you uh-huh. would do you know of course you would of course you would um, so, so that was great and after about six months he moved down to London. He went to work at uh, uh, Capital Radio in London. And he was doing the afternoon show at the time. And the guy that took over, Bobby Hain, who's now one of the big bosses at STV, he turned out, was a big fan of what I was doing as well. And he said, why don't you take over Mike's show? So I think it was 12 to 2 in the afternoon. Lunchtime I was on. What a shift that was, mate. Try, oh, what, play dance music? No, it wasn't dance music. Yeah, it was just, just like normal. chart music. But it was like, you know, it was 1990s, so it was all like Madonna and all that kind of stuff. 12 to 2 is a great show, don't it? Because you can sleep late and then you're... At Still in at 11 o'clock, you know what I mean? You're up the road for about half two. Uh-huh. Oh, was, like... was the breakfast show always something that you had your eye on? Not really. The breakfast show that happened accidentally. Um, the presenter who was on the breakfast show, funnily enough, turned up pissed. <laughs> <laughs> right? This Love is a him. true story, right? right? The guy, God bless the guy, he, he was, I think he had a problem and he, had, he hadn't drunk for years and he went on holiday and he fell off the wagon and he came back and he was on air steaming and they had to take him off and I had to fill in until they got someone and that was 20, 23 years ago. And you've been doing it ever since? I don't think they're going to get someone now. It's still there. <laughs> still so that guy on. never fell off so the wagon, you wouldn't have been in the break. Exactly. Right? That guy might still be doing it now to this day. I mean, the guy was a great presenter. Yeah. I'm not going to name him. But, him um, and Dougie Dunn are sitting in the booze or somewhere. Sit, can hate you that bastard, baby. <laughs> you get the rounds in, Dougie. <laughs> but um, on DJs, I need to be honest, you're only my third favourite. Okay, who's number one on your list? Number one's Dr. Neil Fox. Oh, that's controversial. And number two is Mr. Robert Petter. Bobby well, Bobby, Bobby's great. I mean, but I, I, I love Bobby. I met him at, um, him and my wife became good pals at uh, John Hartson's foundation Dinner, ball. right, okay. Because I always do a, a wee set for John at the end of his ball yeah. every year. And uh, Bobby was there and, you know, he was talking about his DJing and all that and he was sitting next to my wife and the two of them just hit it off brilliant. Your wife no must have much of a personality. Nah, well, and, she, and she's a Rangers fan, so right, you had okay. a Rangers fan and a, a Celtic guy having <laughs> a, a conversation. But yeah, they just uh, hit it off really well. So, has, have you given him a few tips and stuff like that? No, he could give me a few tips. Is he good, Bobby? Bobby's yeah. not bad on the is decks. All joking aside, he's really good on the decks. It's a different type of music for me. It's more kind of funky stuff and all that, but it's great. Have you ever had any like famous faces faces coming up to you, sorry, and uh, and asking like want to get into it or are we interested in it? Um, Over nah, year? not really. Nah. I don't think. I don't think you get a lot of celebrities or celebrities out with music wanting to be DJs, you know what I mean? Not like you do in, in America and London, you know, you get like Paris Hilton and 
Frank Bruno and all these guys want to do. There's never really been anyone. Is it, in... Idris Elba does it, so does it? Yeah, that's what I mean. There's uh, a lot of English people do it, but there's. I think Idris Elba was always a DJ though. Right. Okay. I think he was a that's DJ from yeah, from back in the day. He's actually quite good. You know what I mean? He's not just a, a chancer. Yeah. I remember doing a gig with Nigel Benn, the, the Dark Destroyer once, right? Right. And it, you couldn't make this up. It's like we'd both been to the same record shop in Miami, because my parents had a place in Miami. We've both been to the same record shop in Miami and bought the same record bag so for carrying our vinyl, because it was vinyl back in the day. Yeah. So I finished the gig and I picked up my records and walked out and he thought I'd picked up his records, so he's chasing after me, man, out of the gig, a dark destroyer no chasing way. after my ass. It was terrifying. <laughs> and, and then I said, no, 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 I said, oh, yeah. I said, this is my bag. He said, oh, they're mine, mate, you're trying to think my records and all that, what's your game? I'm like, no, no, I'll show you and opened them up. And of course, I had a completely different type of music from him. And it was just coincidence that we both been to the same record shop in Miami and bought a record bag. Amazing. Uh, just last week, but on the radio, uh, how much have you seen it seen it change over the years? I've seen it change a lot for the better and for the worse and I think it's right, actually better? Go going for it first. Back. Well, first of all, it's better now because since in the past six months, um, they've given me more of a free hand. They've actually listened to me and said, you know what, you actually know Glasgow better than the people that pick the music and all that. So if you want to tweak the music and drop tunes in, you can do that. See, before we had a, a guy telling us what music we can play, oh. what we could and couldn't play. And I was going on to them about Jerry Cinnamon. I said, this guy's massive. I said, what a guy, Jerry. You, you, can't, you can't underestimate how big this guy is. Louis Capaldi was another one I was telling them about three years ago. I said, these two guys are going to be the biggest thing. I said, I've seen them both live at Transmit. The Hydro, we are going to be there soon, young man. You want to Absolutely. come? Absolutely. I saw that. I heard it sold out. You're going to come? come? I'll come along, Good check man. it out. Oh, you can be a DJ. That'll be great. I'll drop some tunes for you. Go yes, on. Yes, can you That'll be a vest? Cool. Play bits and pieces. Yes, now we're talking. Vest. So I said, um, we need to play these guys. And then eventually, um, my boss said to me, you know what, George is right. What? When Jerry, the turning point was when Jerry sold out Hamden. Josh Bates has been going on about this guy for about three years. Because we, me and Sparkers had done the remix of Belter. We knew how big it was. Yeah. We'd put it up on YouTube and it got like eight million hits. And wow. we're like, this is, this is just mental. Uh, and if you look at the, the breakdown of the Scottish charts, you'll see Belter's been in the top 20 for 110 weeks. So people in Glasgow want to hear that music. Yeah. And Somebody in Manchester or London shouldn't be telling me what people in, in Glasgow want to hear. And thankfully now they're not. They're, they let us do what we want and that, it's, it's got better that way. But for years, not just Clyde, every radio station. I mean, you look at the other stations now, you know what I mean? It's like Capital and Heart and all that. They, they used to be rival stations to us because they had good local breakfast shows. You know, they had guys like Des Clark. Folk like that doing the rival show. Clark? Well, he's my mate, but he was my rival as well because. Uh, would you ever roll a bit with him? Nah, I reckon I could take you with Dennis Elbow, man. He's, he's, he's guy, a fake fan on his own. I'm not going to have a wee guy. He can do it well, though. I'm not going to have a wee guy. But the guys like Gary Spence and, and Des Clark, they're my pals, and it was kind of difficult when we were rivals. But um, of course, their stations all changed, and now they all come from England. They, these guys all get bumped, you know yeah. what I mean? Gary's was now. Shocker. And. Uh, it's a lot worse for them, but now for us it's great because like we've got Glasgow. You There's know what I mean? For us, there, young man. Man, man, got, I just got my eyes on our food. Starving. Starving right? <laughs> uh, do, you, do you ever get to meet like Capaldi and Jerry? And... Do you know? I, I've never met Jerry, which is bizarre considering that You're we got so that, much that, success on the back of that tune. Uh, but Jerry's a very private guy. I think yeah. he doesn't do a lot of interviews. Lewis I met a few times, and um, I was talking to his dad today actually. Oh, you're right. Yeah. Um, but Lewis said to me I was the first person ever to play him on the radio. You think Lewis Capaldi is never off the radio yeah, now. Yeah. Me. And the fight, he said the first guy ever to play him on the radio was me when I played a, a remix of Bruce. It wasn't even me that did it. It was the Xander Nation boys did a guest mix for the GBX and they put a remix of Bruce's on it. Right. And it was the first time it had ever been played on the radio. And I thought it was Paolo Nutini when I heard it. I thought, oh, what's that? I got on it, Paolo. I said, what's that new tune you've done? And he said, I've not done a new tune. I thought, what the hell is that? And uh, some say, well, oh, is this guy Lewis Capaldi? I thought, that tune's amazing. Mm. I started playing it every week after that. So you're responsible for the wee baked potato doing well as well? No, it's nothing to do with me, man. He's responsible for that. Uh, what he's a brilliant, job he's done, uh, isn't he? See, he's PR, see, he's He has done it proper, that. isn't he? Yeah, he's just amazing. Just incredible what he's done. But I, we had somebody phone the day, and this is, you know, he's playing the hydro. Hey, when we're filming this, he's playing the hydro. And... Uh, Last night there was a, a woman phoned and she was in tears this morning because her, her son had a brain injury and they'd been looking forward to this Lewis Capaldi gig and they'd bought tickets and paid over the odds from and the boy had a, a seizure right. right before the game and he couldn't go so he missed the whole show 
spent the whole time in the ambulance room and everything. And she phoned up distraught today. And I was like, look, if I had tickets, I would give you them, but I generally don't. I don't know if anyone could help. Some guy got in his car and drove to the radio station and handed over a pair of tickets and said, I don't want my name mentioned. I don't want anything in return. It's just, I heard that story and that affected me and I feel I've done my bit now. Amazing. Only in Glasgow, that's Glasgow. Well, funnily enough, that's what the guy's dad said, because he was from Leeds originally. He said right. he's been living in Glasgow for 28 years. He said that would never happen anywhere else apart from Glasgow. Amazing. And so, but even Lewis's dad phoned in and said, you know, I know a guy. I can get you tickets. <laughs> is his dad a good, good guy? His dad's a good guy. How, how did I've you get him a couple of times. It's just from phoning the show. Right. I, I, I wouldn't say I'm pally with him. I wouldn't say I know him. He just phoned in. He's phoned in a couple of times. Uh, and he, he phoned in today to say he would help that, that wee boy out, which I thought was amazing. That's brilliant, man. A nice yeah, family, me and Slaney you know? were, nice uh, family. We, we met, we got backstage with Jerry's gig at Trans, wasn't it? Aye, how was what he? Guy? Oh, he's, he is. He'll be a fan of the podcast, eh? Aye, he likes Aye. open goal, but oh, I love, he's just, there's something about him, do you know what I mean? Aye, it's just, <laughs> it's a magic. Do you know what I love about Jerry, right? And it's an inspiration to everyone. He's done it himself. Self, uh, he's not. He's not signed to a record label, he's got some big agent, some big manager. It's him and his missus just doing it, you know what I mean? Then everything he says, even cutting his, his own hair. Aye. By the look signs. Boys you get like someone it. in to do that. Um, what was I going to say? Um, you mentioned Paolo Nettini there as well, so Paolo with him. Um, I've known Paolo for a long, long time. When's he I, coming back? We're all missing him, eh? That gorgeous face. Funnily enough, we had Paloma Faith in last week and she was saying exactly the same thing. She said, when's Paolo coming back? Yeah. She put a message to him on here and said, Paolo, come back. Thank you all. Nah, I don't think he needs to. Come on. Well, why? He's done it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's like, he can come back whenever he wants, but right now he's he's just loving life, I'm guessing. Just chilling. Aye. It's like, I think Paolo's the type of guy that could come back in 20 years and have a number one album, you know what I mean? Yeah. Without doing anything in between, he's that talented. Mm. And I don't think he even knows how talented he is, you know, that way. I think he's just... Look, I remember I played keyboards for um, this band, I can't even remember what they were called now, but Paolo was... Uh, they asked me to come and play keyboards on one of their tracks at the Queen Margaret Union, Speedway, right. that was it. And uh, Paolo was a roadie at the time. And it was just a wee guy, 16, and he was like wiring up my, my keyboards and stuff. No way. And I'm like, all right, mate. He said, uh, I'm a singer myself. He said, I listen to the show and all that. And I said, oh, I know your mum from Paisley and all that. I'm not asking you, Because uh, uh, he had the chip shop and all, all right, that. Sorry. No, it was nothing like that. <laughs> <laughs> I knew your mum from the chip shop in Paisley and all that kind of stuff. And he went up and he said, oh, I'm doing the support act. And he sang. And we, I thought, oh, come and watch the wee boy. And I was like, oh, my God, this kid's incredible. Uh, yeah, but he got discovered that a a Clyde event. I mean, the Paolo story is mental. Right, go, could you tell us it quickly? David Snedden won Fame Academy. That's right, so he did. Right? So, Clyde did a, a reception for him, or, well, Paisley did a reception for him at the town hall, and Clyde were there doing the, the disco and stuff and recording it all and all that kind of stuff. And his plane was delayed because of fog in London. So Gavin Pearson, who was the presenter on the day, said, right, why don't we do our, our own version of Fame Academy? He said, anyone in the crowd who uh, fancies himself as a, a singer? And the boy comes up in his school uniform, Paul Paolo. No just way. blows the roof off the place. The place went mental. And the guy from the record label quit his job with Mercury Records to go and manage Paolo. Oh, my God. Mental, isn't it? Ah, it's it was brilliant. all on the back of... Somewhere of yourself, that, so it's just wee different that, circumstances. Right place, right time. I mean, Paolo would have made it anyway. Yeah. I'm a chancer, I just got lucky, but uh, <laughs> Paolo would have made it, no bother. That's amazing. What about favourite favourite um, singer that you've met, musician? Um, Is that one that you just hit off with? What, yes. Randomly, uh, no longer with us, unfortunately, George Michael. No way. I love George Michael. nicest guy. I was petrified interviewing George Michael. Bastard, I flew down to London and everyone said, oh, he's a nightmare. He's, he, he's so hard to interview and all this and it's, it's going to be a disaster. That's what people the, told me about you, by the way. Exactly, well, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> We're nearly finished. No, um, the, guy, the guy was uh, uh, for the record label he said, I know you might have 20 minutes with George, but it might only be five or 10. He said, because the interviews aren't going well and George wants to go home. And I was like, oh, Jesus, I'm, I'm recording an hour long special. Yeah. I said, this is not good. So we went in, he said, right, I'll, George will um, give me a sign when it's time to wrap up the interview. So I said, right, oh, no good, right, looks like the hour-long special, no happen. But we still get an interview for the breakfast show with George Michael, great. So we went in, and I don't know, he just hit it off me, I just started talking, shooting the breeze, talking about Glasgow, talking about playing the Apollo with, yeah. with Wham, and I said I'd been at the gig and remembered a few things that happened, so I told him about them. We just hit it off, and after 40 minutes, 
I was like, George, I'm going to have to wrap this interview up, mate, because I've got to fly back to Glasgow. Yeah. And I said, well, it was lovely meeting you. And about a week later, the record company phoned up and said, um, George has asked uh, the guy from Clyde that did the interview, he was talking about being a DJ, would you like to support him at Hamden? No chance. So I was, <laughs> I was like, yes, I would. Thank you very much. So I had both George Michael had his on stage at Hamden and all that supporting him. And it was did, just you, did you get amazing. a drink in that one? No, I got talking to him and Come stuff. And it's just, I've interviewed him a few times since. It was really sad when he died, you know what I mean? Because he, he was a lovely guy. Do you think that was just your personality that got you out there? I think so. I think it was just that. two guys just hit it off, you know what I mean? It's just like, these people parked here. Brilliant. That's amazing, too. I George, mate, he is a proper superstar, isn't he? Proper superstar and a lovely fella. Is that the hard bit about Radio C, having to talk pish constantly? Aye. Sometimes you get a knack for talking pish, you know what I mean? You and me are both got a knack for talking <laughs> pish. We can do that. Because you, you after I mean? 25 years, you're like, what else can I talk about you? Aye. It's, it, it must drive my family insane. It's just constantly talking pish. My kids hate it when I talk about them. Oh, my God, they hate it. What, on the so radio? Much. Aye. It's like, just... Please, Dad, shut up. Don't yeah. say anything. They're scared to say anything in front of me because they know I'll make it in the rear. You, you can't ask people to phone in and tell us what's happening in their lives if you don't tell them what's happening in your life, you know what I mean? It can't be a one-way street. It's got to be two-way, right? Here's what's happening with me. Oh, if you think that's bad, my wings are doing this, my wife's doing this, my husband's doing that. You've got to, to share it, you know? Right, if that's the case, I'll need to share something. I think, I think she's going to leave me. Aye. Uh, that's what happens, mate. Do you, uh, <laughs> do you, uh, Go to Savoy tomorrow night, come up with me, I'll get you a lumber, we'll be fine. <laughs> See, when you've done like a, a big show or a, a big night out or the radio, do you I, find it hard to go home and switch off now? Yes, after a big gig. Uh, Christmas was really tough. I was doing, I was doing Hilton. I, did, I think I did 14 nights in the Hilton, 700 people a night. And it was mental, it was just all big GB exchange. Mm. It was like a concert, they were all standing in front of the stage, just hands in the air singing along. It wasn't like they were dancing around their handbags, it was like everyone was just facing was it, you, uh, singing along. It, it felt great. Yeah. And afterwards you would go home and, you know, I would be getting home at like half 12 at night and the alarm would be going off at half four and I'd still have a ringing in my ear and I'd be trying to get to sleep, but I wouldn't be able to do it. It was just like murder. Have you ever thought about chucking it there? Never, never. I, I, too lucky, man. It's it's the best life, honestly. Is it, eh? It's the best life. It's it's just amazing. Just blessed to be able to do what I do. It's incredible. I can't believe I've been able to hang on this long, well, uh, still right. doing it. But I've, I've signed another five-year contract, so he's have stuck me for another five years. Five years? Five, five year deal? At least another five years. Have you got an agent? Um, well, my missus. My missus of course, takes eh? care of everything. Amazing, so I am here for another five years, like like a lump at people. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> We've got the man for five years. Right, big football fan as well. Love the tone. I can Love tell you're into your music more than you are football because yeah. you support Martin. Do you there. know it's? Uh, I was never. I, I never played football. You know what I mean? Right. So I've never that into. I go occasionally to the Morton game. I used to go a lot more when I lived in Kilbarkin. Um, I, I had a season ticket. Uh, for a bit, I don't have a season that ticket now because I'm year. living in Glasgow. That was a good year. See that good year we had when yeah. it, uh, Duffy was in charge and we had oh, Jake Duffy, Tongo right? banging yeah, them yeah. in, and um, you know Big Tam will wear at the back. I think Big Tam scored Big more goals. Tam, yeah. I DJed at Tam's wedding recently. Did you? Right? Big Tam scored more goals than any other defender in Europe that season. Um, that was Sometimes a great year. Head, don't it? No yeah. he scored all the goals. Uh-huh. We got the playoffs. Um, we got the semi final. At Hamden against Aberdeen, which was Tedza playing as well. Tedza. Yep, Tedza oh, was Tedza playing Tedza as well. He wasn't getting a game all the time. Tedza, he was coming off the bench. Oh, he didn't. I'm, I'm so happy that him, you said him. that on the camera, mate, because he'll be raging with it. <laughs> 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 but the it's garage, true, and there it is. Yeah, there it is. Right, that's so where it started for me. That, right, so see, was your ah, see up there. That's where my dad used to live. Wow. Metal, isn't it? Metal. So, so how did he become to buy the boat? So he, well, no, his parents owned the building. Right. So it was, it was a ballroom called the New Astoria which his dad started um, put my hazards on. his dad started about I don't know how many years ago during the war maybe or after the war or something like that right. so a long time ago and then you know my dad inherited it and he turned it into it was an under I think it was an under 18s club called Shuffles back in the 70s and then in the 80s they got a licence and they called it um, the Mayfair and it was that's kind of like the rave scene it was one of the kind of first clubs for the, the whole rave scene, we think TTF and Ultrasonic and all that, played some of their early gigs in there Brilliant. back in the day, you know what I mean? And it, it was a great venue, but it just kind of ran its course. And then my dad took ill and couldn't really run it anymore. 
and leased it out to uh, CPL, Donald McLeod. And now, obviously, my dad's gone, but my mum still runs that side of the business. And, and CPL now, they have it for like a 20-year lease or something. So they run it, and they've done an amazing job, man. So that was your that bedroom there? But No, I, I never lived in it. That was my dad's. He'd have been up there somewhere. Well, that's seen a bit of action, isn't it? In the attic. Know. Oh, I bet you did back in the day. You remember the ballroom <laughs> dancing? Or so when did it turn into the garage? Well, into my room. Um, <laughs> it turned into the garage, I think it was the early 90s. No, early 90s. I mean, I'd, I'd made it clear that I didn't want to get involved in the family business. I think the plan was for me to take it over. But then my kind of radio career had taken off, and that's all I wanted to do. Um, I was going to say, I'm not really a businessman, but I suppose what I do is a business, a whole GBX thing's a business. Yeah. So maybe... Reluctantly, I had become a businessman, but at the time, all I wanted to be was a DJ. What, um, is that your favourite place to, is it nice to DJ in there, knowing that it was your dad's place and stuff? I, do you know, I did a gig, uh, just actually downstairs in it, last week. There, there's a thing, it was an amazing uh, club called Include Me Too, and what it is, it's for people with, like, addition, adults with additional support needs. Right. And they take, that are intimidated to go to a club, but love dance music. So you put this night on once a month for the garage, and they have, like, yeah, guest DJs. So I do it, like, maybe four times a year, I'll turn up and do a set oh, at it. And it, it's just, it's an amazing, amazing vibe. And it was really weird going back in there and thinking, this is where it all started for me, mm -hmm. and I'm back here now. But, yeah, it was just incredible to watch all these people who, who love dance music but could never go to a club because they would be intimidated and they would get hassle off of drunks and all that kind of stuff. Go there and enjoy themselves. That's a great thing. Giving something back. I love it, mate. Right, we'll fire on. <clears throat> We're going to go to Hamden now, aren't we? Aye. Right, let's Hamden. do it. Let's get out of here. What about when... Did, did, did the garage maneuver. go on fire now? Aye, in the, the 80s. The roof, the roof was on, the roof fire, went on right fire. And that was really frustrating because, see, back then, right, it was open seven nights a week and it was rammed. Right. It was seven ab nights a week. Seven nights a week. It? it was packed out. It was Monday nights, there'd be a queue down the street. Why was that? Because the music was so good. Um, just because they did different things. They did like a Monday night, I think they did a kind of cheaper night. People with their Monday books. Uh, and a Thursday night, they did a reggae night, which was packed because there was a big reggae scene in Glasgow in the 80s. I'm talking like early 80s. I reggae was massive in Glasgow in the early really? 80s. Mental. Uh, and then it was just busy as a club at the weekend, so like seven nights a week it was mobbed and I don't know what happened. They, they say that something went wrong in a fridge in the bar. I wouldn't be surprised if someone torched that, I'm I don't sure know. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know what happened, but it got burnt down and, you know, it, when he, he rebuilt it and it was never the same after that. It's funny, but now, now it is, it's great. But I, I don't know if it, like a rival just because it, it was doing so well, but I remember my dad being absolutely distraught because you had this club that was heaving seven nights right. a week and then nothing. You know what I mean? But they got no bad you pay it, though. No, because he rebuilt it. Oh, so he never right. got a pair. He never got he any money. He just, to get what he did was he, he just he, he rebuilt it. And, what a guy. You know, he's been lying, lying empty for a year. It's a bit like Victoria's up here, you know what I mean? Yeah. They rebuilt that. You've got to start all over again. Hey, why, why did you stop? Going back to more, why did you give up the what, season ticket? Yeah, uh, because I moved to Glasgow. When I lived in Kilbarkin, it was handy. I jumped down with a couple of mates. And I find it's difficult for me because I'm on air at six o'clock, right? So it's like, it's like me saying to you, I'll meet you at 12, but you need to prepare for all this. And well, clearly you haven't, but yeah. <laughs> you, would need, to, else does, you would need to get organised and it would be in the back of your head like I've got a, risk going this way, aren't I? Yeah. Um, you'd be in the back of your head, oh, I've got a, a show to record and all that kind of stuff. and. It's difficult to enjoy a game when you know you've got a four-hour radio show to do after it and then a load of gigs as well. So it was just one of those things I thought, I can't be bothered driving for Glasgow all the way down to Green Up. Uh, so watch my team getting gubbed. <laughs> watch Jim Duffy's bald head. Um, why, uh, why did you never support Celtic Rangers? Because my mum was a big Celtic fan and my dad was a big Rangers fan and I didn't even want to get involved. Uh, would they, would they argue? Uh, no, really, do you know, it's funny. I, I never saw my mum and dad argue about anything. No. I'm sure they did, because me and my wife argue all the time, but uh, I don't know if we do it in front of the kids. And they never did it in front of me, and certainly they never heard them argue about football. No. Um, football was never really discussed. They were both into it, but my, I think my dad was much more into it than my mum. You know what I mean? But I've done work for both Celtic and Rangers over the years, so... Is, that, is it, it annoying is that it, people are always wanting you to know what, what side you are? Um, that's Glasgow, isn't it? Yeah. That's always going to happen. That's that's part of the city. That's is it safer it is. for you to be a Morton fan? Or has that never came into it? It's never really come into it, but I suppose if I did support, say, like when I was in primary school, I was a Celtic fan, so if, if I did support Celtic, I probably wouldn't tell anyone. Mm -hmm. And then I did work for Rangers when I was older. I did their 
their half-time draw and stuff. So if I supported Rangers, I probably wouldn't tell anyone either. So it probably would be safer to say I was a Morton fan. But I genuinely don't support either of the big two. No. I'm not really a massive football fan, to be honest with you. You know what I mean? I, I like going to games with my pals. Do you play five sides in it? No, nah, never nah. played football in my life. I, I do the boxing, which we'll talk about later, but I've never, that's the only sport I've really done. Oof, oof. Theory, me, young man. There we go. Tremendous. Um, but, but your wife's a Rangers fan? My wife's a Rangers fan, and I took um, my daughter to Caplow a couple of times, but she didn't fancy it. Scared her for life, Aye, but... it's one of those. What so, about your boy, Nan? Uh, he's, he supports Rangers that he's more, unfortunately. So did they go to Ibrox? Um, yes, they do. Did they, right? Yeah, he couldn't get him to go to Caplow either. It was one of those. Uh, my father-in-law was a massive Rangers fan. He used to watch Ross when he was a boy, and I think he watched a lot of the games with him, and that, that's how he got into it. So you never tagged along, no? I've never tagged along, no. No, I've, I've no interest in, in either Rangers or Celtic going no. to the game. Like, say if they're playing in Europe, great, I want them both to do well, you know what I mean? They both had that run there and it was brilliant. And it would have been great if they'd come up against each other oh, in a yeah. semi-final or something. That would have been amazing for Scotland <laughs> in general, for Glasgow. Um, but I've, I've just never really fancied it. It's just... It's all about the beats, man, isn't it? It's all about all the about beats, the tunes, all about the tunes and right, all that kind of stuff. But I, I'd enjoy... Like going a lot of Capolo and you get to know some of the players and it's, it's fun, you know. I mean, I'm from Greenock originally, so it was kind of like the local team stuff. So, aye. But you were an announcer at Ibrox. I was. For, How was that good? Uh, it was. I was fine. It was good. It, you know what? It was funny. Uh, people don't believe me when I say this, but hardly anybody that worked. I don't know what it's like now because I'm talking 15 years ago. Hardly anybody that worked there supported Rangers. Really? Like, yeah. Now, I don't know. Nobody ever asked me when they offered me that job what team I supported. Which is good. Which is a good thing, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, hardly anyone. There's a lot. You you would be surprised at how many Celtic fans work there. At uh, Ibrox, right? Incredible amount of Celtic fans because they would always get to go to Celtic again. They would right. never miss a match because the two of them would never play in the same oh, day. Of course, uh, right. But um, there was very few. I, I, I mean, I'm taught a long time ago, it might be different now, and I don't know if that's a policy they had. Somebody once said to me it was because um, you'd concentrate on the job and not the game, which makes a lot of sense. Of course. Am I best going this uh, way? To Hamden, uh, yeah, you to go this way. Uh, East Cup Rider, we'll go back on Tell my Morton fan. How'd you get Hamden for it? <laughs> um, see the announcement, when you were announcer, did you ever get to socialise with players, managers, have much um, dealings with them? I, I got a, bit, a few of the players. I got quite pally with, um, not pally, but would um, talk to if I met him on a night out with uh, Ronald De Boer. Oh, because wow. he. Massive name. Well, what happened with Ronald was he moved to the, the city, obviously, from, from. Was it Barcelona he was with before? I can't remember. Yeah, I think but it was he, Barcelona. He moved, and he had a Good couple knowledge. of young kids. And um, somebody had said that I'd do the radio, and he did the school run in the morning, said, any chance you could give them a mention on the, on the radio show? So I did, I just said hello to them. And apparently all the kids at school heard it and it, it kind of helped them settle in. Settle and in he it. remembered that and it was always very friendly to me when he saw me and stuff. So that was nice, you know what I mean? And it, that's why you want your hands and face like a Holland strip. Exactly, that's exactly what it is. It's a tribute to you, <laughs> Ron. This is for you, Ron. <laughs> uh, right, we need to ask you about the specky tube. Hugh Keevans oh, was a long chin. running sport. You used to terrorise him, man. No, he was, was he an easy he was target. Like my dad. He was like my dad. He's, he's my adopted dad. Hugh is the nicest man yeah. you could ever meet. I mean, you'll know Hugh. You know what I mean? Done, huh? He's just such a lovely guy. The whole thing's an act. The, the, what he's the doing on the radio. Man, yeah, uh, of course. He knows that if he goes out and says something that's going to get a reaction, you're going to get calls. What would you like you to do? Oh. I would like you to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah. There you go. Favourites, Pure Radio? Aye, that's just in there. Yeah. Oh have you got to check out all the competition? <laughs> I don't think Pure Radio is in there, is it? Um, the, all the Absolute stations are in there. I quite like Absolute 90s and Kistry. Oh, Kistry's brilliant. Kistry's great, isn't it? I love Kistry. Really good. Uh, I love Trevor Nelson, you like that, isn't it? Nah, it's a bit hey, soulful for me. I like oh, it more like soul, banging. Like, nah, I'm not really a soul boy. Uh-huh. Right, OK. Uh, uh, so you keep in, but see, like, would you socialise with him? Yes, absolutely. Hughes, Hughes, my pal. Good company. And, and great company. He's got so many great stories and just an absolute gentleman, you know what I mean? Yeah. Just a lovely, lovely guy. Uh-huh. Uh, see, this, the, the super scoreboard, you listen, you listen to it? Aye. Yeah. Aye, when you're not on that. I don't know. <laughs> That's no, too no, PC for me, mate. No, uh, of course I listen to Super Scoreboard, yeah. absolutely. Can I you think... believe the stick that some of the guys get? 
you put it out there, don't you? So they're wanting it. That's what you're getting paid for. I mean, I think it's difficult now to be a pundit or even a footballer like you guys. You know what I mean? They're doing what you're doing. See, with social person. media and all that, you must get so much abuse. I mean, I don't know about you, but I don't read the comments. If I put something up on Facebook and there's like 100 comments, I'm going to read them. Because see if there's 99 good comments and you one guy says bandit, you're a prick, you'll be like, let's check it. This guy's profile, <laughs> your wife's fucking ugly. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> you're that, that was me, that was me. I know him. I'm not doing that show now. Tell me, shove his fucking car fan. <laughs> oh, brilliant. Uh, right, you are, a, you are a sort of sportsman, as you say. Old bear ass boxing. Ah, I like the boxing, you know what I mean? So what, do you I'm up here actually left train? Um, oh no, go left here, left here, mate. left here. Yeah. So I, I love the, I love the boxing. Um, I've always been into boxing. I did a wee bit of boxing in school and stuff in the playground. No, I did a wee bit of boxing in school, and I always liked it. It's just that. It, silky shots. I find it a way to keep fit, and I, I just like silky shots. Mm-hmm. That kind of thing. So, um, my son, when he was about ten, maybe wanted to get into boxing and we looked about and there was a boxing club in Johnson and he didn't want to go on his own I said right I tell you what your old dad will come with you I'll come with you and we'll do this and we went to this boxing club in Johnson and I thought it'll probably be good fitness for me for a couple of weeks and he didn't really like it and I loved it I thought oh I'm into this man and then I get into the sparring and stuff and I thought first time someone hit me in the face was a bastard um, but you get a bit about it and you get a buzz out of it and I thought this is great. And then they're missing you and suddenly you're blocking them and you're hitting them and I'm thinking, this is great, I'm loving this. Uh, so I just got into it and then he said, I think Ian McLeod, do you know Ian McLeod? Yeah. He was a, he was a Commonwealth boxer, Commonwealth champ. Back probably battered them before then. And, ah, yeah, he probably battered them while they were dancing. And um, he said, oh, I want to do a charity night for uh, a click sergeant. He said, Tommy Sheridan's going to box at it. Do you want to fight him? Should I fight him, brother? Yeah, brother. Well, that's what Tommy was like. Tommy came on the show. Well, box him out, brother. And we'll do this and we'll do that. And that's what we did. And it was great. And Tommy won controversially. He's a big but boy, though, Tommy. That's a big it's boy. A bit of weight hey, difference now. Do you know what? He had, he had a lot more hair. experience than me. And uh, I wouldn't say he's more. Hair. Hairy back and he's hairy got very hairy uh, he's got very hairy Hairy knuckles. Not a lot of hair on his head, but he's got a lot of hair on his <laughs> Hairy knuckles. Carrying a bit extra weight with all that hair. And aye, aye, he's a good boxer, Tommy. And, Is he? And he's, a, aye, he's good. He's a good lad. So he beat me and then he fought a Janny randomly. <laughs> <laughs> what? I don't know. He couldn't make this up. He fought a Janny and uh, the Janny beat him. And then I fought the Janny and I beat the Janny. Oh, so you're the winner then? So there you go. That's nah, it. You're the winner. So what, did Tommy Sheridan knock you out or was it points? No, it was points. It was a split decision. He devastated, yeah. didn't he? I was gutted, mate. I was absolutely. I, I take, I'm very competitive. Right. I take it really seriously. So on like, camera, you know, would, would you go again? Oh, that, I think you're best oh, in this. Best in would you go again? Uh, oh, I, I've gone again a few times. Have you? Yeah, uh, I fought Gordon Smith as well. No way. Nah, I fought Gordon Smith. You'd let it happen. Oh, okay, Gordon, Gordon Smith. That, I fought him at uh, Greenock Town Hall, actually. I've, I fought, maybe I had about five or six fights. I haven't had a fight for about seven or eight years because I had a a brain problem and I wasn't allowed to fight anymore. Oh, no, um, I had shrinkage in my brain or something. I, I don't know what happened. Water oh, getting... Was that scary? I, get, I, I, I don't know what happened. It's like, due to lack of sleep, my brain really? shrunk, aye, and, and water getting... And it was causing me, like, constant headaches. Uh, so... I, I just said it was just due to my shift pattern, I'm doing the breakfast show and going out and doing clubs and that. So I had to rein it in a wee bit. And... That's one of the main reasons why I stopped drinking and stopped partying all the time. So I kind of gave up. I still do the boxing and the sparring and the training, but I haven't done a, a white collar fight wow. since. But I would like to do it again. I feel How much many hours sleep you get? About five, maybe. Aye, it's did, not you feel, did you feel drained? Huh? Aye, I feel a bit drained. But I, I, I normally get by in about five hours sleep a night, but I'll try and get an hour during the day. It's difficult when you've got three kids. It's easier now because we've only got the one way in the house now. Yeah. But before, you know, I had one in primary school, one in high school, one in nursery, and there's people coming and going all day. It's difficult to try and get a kid. You're all right it's now? It's better now. Much better now. Good, mate. Aye, there we go. So we're there. But we'll hug it out after this. What you said about yourself being hungover, you ever had a, a star come on that was, was hungover? Still oh, I am. Um, see, I used to like a good bevy, and I went to, we won an award in New York. Um, for the breakfast show of the year, which is quite amazing because it was a worldwide thing. I don't know why the hell they must have been a bad year because the fuck does. So we got flown out to New York and we did the show live from Times Square and stuff. And we went to this award ceremony and my wife flew out and all that and it was great. And 
we went out and we're just on it for the whole weekend. It's mental. And we came back, we're still pissing when we came back. And we had to do the show the next day. So I had to get a taxi in the morning and all that kind of stuff. And Ronan Keaton came in, because this was in Boys Home with other people. Yeah. Ronan Keaton came in to do an interview. And I was like, oh, Christ, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this show. And then so I remember Ronan's coming in live, and I was like, oh, Christ. Oh, yeah. And uh, he came in, he was worse than me. He was <laughs> 10 that. times worse than me, man. It was like two drunken men <laughs> sitting and slurring the world. I'm sure the old guy I took the show off in the first place was like, Buster, I get sacked for this. <laughs> How come he's staying on? <laughs> oh, brilliant, man. Was Ronan Keaton all right? He was great. Uh, uh, he was fine. He was just like really, really rough, really hungover. He actually does the magic, breakfast. Magic, didn't he? Yeah, he does the breakfast show on Magic, yeah. which is one of our stations down in. In uh, London. Anyone else you've got? Any other stars that you could that you've enjoyed having on? Robbie's always good chat, man. Oh, Robbie's bro. great. He that... sent us a message saying he wo- listens to oh, the car show. So you watch hey, it, Rob. Rob, what's happening, right. young man? Rob, come back on the show sometime soon, mate. Um, Is he just a good laugh? He's just a great guy, and I've supported him a couple of times. Supported him at Hamden. Uh, twice actually. You and, nervous, didn't and he's great. Yes, I d- uh, Ollie Muzz was supporting him as well, and I met Ollie about six months after, and. He was talking to someone about, um, he was talking to Cassie, there was a breakfast show with me, about yeah. that gig. And Cassie said, do you get nervous for this gig? He said, I was nervous. And I looked at George and saw how much he was Shady. shooting himself. And I felt much better. But I might be bad, but I'm not as bad as this, bro. <laughs> That's brilliant, man. See, like with Robbie and Ollie, do you get a wee drink with them afterwards? Um, no, because Robbie was off it at the time and Ollie didn't drink on tour. So I was gutted, Dude, man. I wanted to go. Oh, I don't, nobody wants to go for me a baby anymore. Me and you'll get a baby after that. That's it. Go get Come back off it. You should see me now. I have like two drinks. I'm like anybody. Uh, it's huh? it's great. Uh, better Save be my fortune, man. Uh, right, traffic updates are synonymous with radio. Mm-hmm. You ever heard of bad accidents and you think, oof, while uh, you're on air? All the time. You see, when you hear of like a road being shut, your, your heart sinks. You always feel the worst, you know what I mean? It's like, it could be someone that was listening to you and, you know, their mum could be waiting for them at home and they're not coming home, you know what I mean? Mm. So it's I, it, it, it's horrible when you hear a road has been closed. That normally means... Oh, uh, so I... Uh, it's just so important to keep worried. to the speed limit these days, isn't it? Aye, you just got to be careful now, because it's like... They put there's so many rush, cars on the road and you're not going to get there any faster. It's not going to make much difference. Yeah. There's no point in horsing it. And what happens if, if you do cause an accident or if you hit someone? Like, you've got to carry that about you for the rest definitely, of your life. Definitely, mate. I mean, that's definitely. a terrible thought, isn't it? My big pity as well, phones. People being on their phones driving. Oh, mate. Honestly, my phone goes in my pocket. Nice that's it. it. I can't have it. Don't have it anywhere. I would never answer my phone when I'm driving. Even a hands-free thing I'm uncomfortable with. Yeah. What about your kids? They drive? Um, my oldest daughter does. My, my son's the oldest of all the kids and he doesn't drive. But, does he um, No, you think he would. He's like a free spirit, that boy. I like my rock music and I'm going to drive. How does um, he get his decks in that bit? Well, his, his partner drives. Right. So she kind of drives. You and him have got it sorted with partners, haven't oh, you? You've got him on toast. It's awesome, eh? Oh my so God, his partner drives well. and he just turns up at the gigs and does his thing, doesn't he? There's two of them, they do it as a double act. Him and his pal, they call right. themselves DJ Frost, because he's Ross and his mates Frank. So oh, they brilliant! Do, so they do it with their masks and all that, and they put on a show. And they get slain in one of the masks, hides his ah, face. Yeah, that'd be good. Uh-huh. Um, do you always remind him about your daughter, especially like, safety drive right, when they're Aye, uh-huh. aye. Just, it's, you know, as a parent, you just worry constantly about your wings, man. Just yeah. constantly. You think you would stop, you think you'd stop worrying when they hit a certain age, but you don't. In fact, I think I'll probably worry more about my daughter now, she's 19, and she's driving and going to clubs and stuff, than I did when she was nine, you uh, know what I mean? Yeah. It's just mental. Right, right, mate, we're at Hamden. We're at Hamden, right. The reason we're going to start with the GBX first, though, because obviously it is absolutely massive. Can you believe how big it's became? I, I, like, I started GBX 25 years ago, and it's mental. It's, I don't know what's happened. It's just, people just get it, which is amazing. Just park it here, mate. That's uh, nice. Sitting on a five minute chat. Aye. Nearly done. So, I, GBX, right, 25 years ago, there was a guy called Tom Wilson, uh, Radio 4 through in Edinburgh, and he was smashing it. And I was a big fan of his show, and he did the gigs, he did the raves and all that. In fact, I think we had him in the, the garage when it was the Mafia. And his figures were through the roof. And I said to Clyde, Do you need a show like that? And Bobby Hain, who was the boss at the time, said, Well, you know, why don't you demo a show like that? 
It's a good idea. So I went away and did this demo, and she said, yeah, I think that'll work. So they put it on, and it did, and it worked really well. Not to the extent it's working now, but it worked really well, and that was about 94. Right. And then when it got to 99, they got a sponsorship deal with Smirnoff. And some genius at Smirnoff said, rather than have a breakfast, because I'd moved to the breakfast show at this yeah. point, rather than have a breakfast show presenter, let's have a club jock doing it. I thought, well, that's not a good idea, because mm. a club jock's not going to be able to talk on the radio, and they're going to be playing songs that are good for the nightclubs, but might not be radio songs, so you, you have 10 minute <laughs> intros and all that yeah, kind of yeah. stuff, you know what I mean? You got, you got to know a bit of both, and I think that was the kind of magic of what we were doing. But no, the client calls the shots, so I get bumped, and they brought in a club jock, and of course the figures went meep down the swanee. So then they tried another club jock and another club jock, and they couldn't resurrect it. And finally, Smirnoff said, "Well, you know, we paid all this money, and we're promised this amount of listeners, and uh, we're pulling the sponsorship." So they pulled the show, and that was it. And there was no GBX for Smirnoff experiences. It was then for a few years, and then somebody started a campaign on Bebo, saying, "How come George Bebo? I remember Bebo. Uh -huh. oh, oh, I got a few get offs for Send you some love, man." Um, so somebody said, why don't you bring back George Bailey on a Saturday night, playing all the, the big dance tunes? Because uh, I was still going out and doing gigs at the time, and playing a bit old school. And someone else said, that's a great idea, and I suddenly it just spiralled, and all, hundreds of people had signed this petition. So I went with uh, Paul Cooney, it was at the time. And I said, Paul, let's do this. And he said, oh, I don't know if it would work. And he said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you 90 minutes. So they had 8% of the audience, and the next set of figures come in, I think it was three months later, and it went to 16%. And then the next set of figures come in like six months after that, and it went to 25%. So we went from a 90-minute show to a four-hour show sure, yeah. in about six months. And now the last set of figures just came out about two weeks ago, and it was 38%, which is the highest it's ever been. Tremendous. 38%. Show, you think all the stations are right there, all the digital stations now and all that. They, that we, used, that we didn't have when we started out. It's just mental to think that that amount of people listen in. Brilliant. It's crazy. So you're responsible for GABX on the radio and you're also responsible for Television X on TV? Aye, aye, a bit of that. that That's a, more the wife and the <laughs> sisters. <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, and then finally, mate, bits and pieces, man. Right, bits and pieces. It's Calvin Harris. It's, it was mental. It's, what happened with bits and pieces, right, it, it was an old 90s song that a guy from Holland did, Patrick Prids. Artemisia did this track and it was about 94 I think he did right about the time GBX started that yeah. show and we used to play it in show all the time and I was playing it as an old school track when GBX came back and I said to my mate Sparkos that we'd been making I'd been making tunes with I said we should do a remix of Bits and Pieces because it does sound a wee bit dated when you mix it in with with a new tune it sounds like a bit from the 90s you know what I mean it doesn't mm. have that banging kick drum that you do so well so he didn't play keyboards I played keyboards and I played it in and he put like, the beats down and all that and we just we made this new version of Bits and Pieces and we put that and the original version on a memory stick and a boy Tom Green who does the breakfast show now on Kiss FM he was up and he was a pal of mine he was doing an interview with Calvin I said give Calvin that memory stick and tell him to play Bits and Pieces just for a joke uh -huh. and I'd been tweeting Calvin and lots of people had been retweeting it and all that so, Tina Park comes along, Calvin comes on, does his set, finishes with Hello by Adele, which is the most random, not even a dance remix of it, just, Hello, it's me, and I'm thinking, is it a beat going to kick in here? No. So he plays Hello by Adele and says, thank you very much, good night, and walks off stage, and everyone's like, what the fuck? So, off He's he goes, bad one, huh? comes back on, and goes, you want one more tune? And he went, yes. And drops bits and pieces. Could you believe it? I was like, what the fuck just happened there, man? And we had our version coming out the following week, and it was just all, it just all fell into place. I thought, oh my God, we're releasing our version on Thursday, and this is Saturday, and he's playing it at wow. Team the Park as his encore. It couldn't have worked out better. So of course, we go into the top 40 in iTunes at the weekend, and it worked out we're playing Ibiza that weekend as well, and when we dropped in Ibiza that would be the best week the best week career. of my life incredible and I just thought this is just magic what's happening here man it's like it was so unexpected yeah. and I've spoken to Calvin since and he said that what happened was his pals were all there on a stag weekend and one of his mates was getting married and they'd put a bar 
backstage at Tien the Park to make it look like the local pub and all his mates were up from Dumfries and he'd mentioned to them this guy Tom Green had given him this uh, memory stick and he says then we know this track bits and pieces and his pal said to him that's my favourite song ever man please play, play that for me because he was getting married and it was his stag weekend and Calvin was his best man that's why they were all there so because his pal was such a big fan he played bits and pieces as his encore Again, we circumstances, so eh? that was it. Just right place at the right time. And it how, much you make it, how much do you make it at? Oh, nothing. You don't make any money out of that. <laughs> you make money out of the gigs. You don't make money out of the streaming. <laughs> See, streaming, right, you make about less than a penny every time. Oh, you know what I mean? It's like, honestly, see if you were to, to work out how much... I was. This is, this is a good showbiz story, right? right? Go for it. You want to talk showbiz stars. I was talking to my next-door neighbour... Arty for the singing kettle. Right. Thank you. Just drop that name right there, the bold wow. Arty. He was biggest uh, name of had. Biggest so name of had. Arty for the singing <laughs> kettle said to me um, that back in the day I should take Ross, my son, to see him. And he said back in the day they used to make their money out the DVDs and the albums and all. That. He said now see what I've been streaming. You don't make any money out of music. That's why you used to buy an album, and then you'd buy a ticket for a concert, and it would be twenty-five quid. Now it's a hundred quid for the concert because they make their money out of the gigs. Gigs, right. So they don't make, you don't make money out of music anymore. You make money out of the live performances. That's why everyone has to go on tour. Which is why we're doing the Hydra. Exactly. Sold out though, so good luck with that. Uh, does it, is it mad to think now when Scotland's going to go that your song Aye, comes it's, on? Honestly, it's the most amazing feeling in the world. And I remember being at the first game when they played it and they got me to DJ first. All my mates were ripping the piss out of me. Tweeting my picture for the picture, check out David Guetta and all that. <laughs> I was just getting pelters. David Guest or David Guetta? Uh, David Justler. <laughs> uh, so I was on there and doing my bit, and then, of course, I, I can't remember who we played. I, I should really remember. Is it Lithuania or something like that? Yeah, that it, sounds about right. It, it we'll go one Lithuania. of those ones, yeah. and we were 1 nothing down. And it was the first game of the tournament. I thought, oh, Christ, I'm going to get the blame for this. You know? <laughs> and then luckily we scored, I mean, it didn't make any difference at the end, but we scored an equaliser towards the end. And as the song went in, and bits and pieces got played, all these people ran at me with their video cameras and started <laughs> filming reaction. my reaction. It was just mental. Really? Some people have said it should be uh, played before instead of Flower of Scotland. Nah, I don't know about that, man. Flower of Scotland's... Unless they want to make it the Could Scottish you not pump that up a wee bit? I could put a... Put a donk in Flower of Scotland. Uh, why don't we do that? We yeah, that guy for the Corrie's still about. Could he come in? Uh, come in and do it live. Jewel. That'd be great. Get him sorted. That'd be cool. I uh, could do a mashup. Uh, Flower of Scotland, Scotland. Of bits and pieces. You obviously do a lot of driving to gigs mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Have you had Quite to pick so. four people to go to a Morton game with? Travel, didn't we? Four Any people. four people who would who were having in the motor? Billy Conley would be in the motor. He's always chat. everyone always yeah. picks Billy Conley. Larry David. Curb your enthusiasm, mate, amazing. Mate, imagine so having good. Larry David in your motor. Right. Calvin Harris for the chat. Calvin Harris, right? Eh? Oh, has he got a good chat? Got, 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 just, do you know quite well? You can pick the tunes. Oh, right, no, okay. he's got that real kind of dry sense of humour. I think me and him could talk about a lot of geeky DJ things and all that. Of course. And uh, I'd probably, and I'm, shit, I'm uh, sorry I'm not going for a footballer, but I'd need to go for my DJ hero would be Tiesto. Wow. Is he, the, is, he the, is he the pinnacle? He's the man, uh, aye. He's, he's the main man. It's funny. It's, you so, met I, we, we did, um, here's the thing, we did Gig in the Green. Remember Gig in the Green? Yeah. Right, so Eminem was on and we were doing the dance tent at it and they had all these DJs on. It was around about the time of a Smurnoff experience, just around, around about the time I was getting pumped. And the first two V Diddy acts that were on, warming up the stage, were me and Tiesto. No way. Right. So we were on first in this V dance tent and then they had all these people. And could you tell even back then when he played? He knew back then he was going to be a star. He just had it, he just had something. He was playing his own tunes and it was like, oh, you're a good man. And a nice good guy. Had. And a great guy, yeah. Lovely guy. I mean, I don't know he's like that. I've not seen him for years, but I'm... DJs don't really change. No. Ah, what I say? You know, we're playing other people's records. We're not, we're not superstars, Do you, you know what I mean? you get big-time DJs now? I suppose Calvin's a big-time DJ and he gets a big-time DJ. It's different for these guys. They're, they're songwriters. And I don't think... like. See, DJs that make music, right? I think they get a tough ride. People say, oh, it's not real music they're making. I think it's... It's more intense than that. It's not like Noel Gallagher turning up with a guitar and singing a song and then going up. This guy's doing everything. Yeah. He's writing the song, he's writing the lyrics, he's writing the chords, he's recording the beats, he's putting all the effects on it, he's mixing the track, he's mastering the track. He's doing everything. By the way, George, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, brilliant to meet you, man. And I'll see you at the hydro. Thank you. In the time it takes to score a goal, you can also lose control. Don't speed, drive smart. smart.